Hello, welcome back to class. We are closing in on the end of the semester, so I am glad to be here with you as we wrap up the time we spent together. I am in the midst of grading your projects. Thank you for spending time on those, for, for giving me your own personal spin on some of the topics, some of the stories, some of the passages that we've studied this year. I'm looking forward to seeing all of them. Just an FYI, because of how much time it takes to grade those, those will be in toward the very end of the semester. I want to give each of them a good bit of attention. We are in this week, chapter 8, The Church, in your book, Theology by McGrath. Now, this, for those of you that have a familiarity with the church, might seem a simple task at first because we grow up going to something called church if we're Christians. But the nature of the word church actually means much more than just the local entity, the local gathering of people, though that is certainly and most validly included in the definition of church. But we have to look at this question of, is it just local or is it global? Is it bound by time? These are questions that we ask about the church. The answer to each of those questions is a bit different. The first couple questions that you're going to see in your text are, is it local or universal is a term that McGrath uses. And what he is pointing to is the history of theology that talks about the Ecclesia Visibilis and Ecclesia Invisibilis, or the visible church and the invisible church. In other words, there is a Reformation doctrine that has actually got many significant roots much earlier in the development of the Christian church that says there is an invisible church that we can't fully comprehend or understand because there's some people who claim to be Christians or participate in the church but aren't devoted to the work of the church. And there are some people who are clearly actively engaging in a Christian life but aren't part of Christian community. They may not even claim a Christian faith. And so we trust God to handle all of that. In the church, we trust that God is the one who confirms the invisible church, the true church. Now, there is a significant wariness within my own heart and within many about how we define that and how we use that theology. And in fact, I rarely talk about this in sermons because I don't want to ever give the impression that I'm the one who decides who is truly in the true church. Because in fact, that is not a human's role. That is not the role of any individual or institution, but rather it is God in Jesus per Christian theology that does that. We see many parables about the end of times when Jesus is sorting the wheat from the chaff, the wheat from the weeds, where the sheep from the goats, that Jesus is the one who sorts this out. And so while we know this is true, this is a theological awareness, we don't use that to organize the church. We organize different things around the church. For instance, Martin Luther's doctrine of the church was the church is truly present wherever the word is rightly proclaimed and the sacraments are rightly administered. So in other words, if you've got the right preaching of the gospel, of the good news of salvation, and if you've got practice of at least communion and baptism, there's the church. More, anything more than that is up to God, and we trust God to handle that. Now, on pages 139 and 140, you're going to find some different ways to view the church. One is the imperialist approach, that there's only one church that we can identify or define. One is the Platonic approach, which means there's an ideal of church out there that we don't know fully, but that we know what ought to be. And so there's some kind of invisible church again, but it is definitely more human oriented in terms of how do we identify that ideal church. There's an eschatological approach. Eschatology is a study of the end of times, the end of all things, and the renewal of things in Christ Jesus. 
And so the eschatological approach is the focus on the unity of the church that will get rid of the brokenness, the divisions in the church on the last day. There's the biological approach, which talks about an organic kind of unity that we have, this kind of sense that even though there are many different denominations, we somehow some way have grown from the same root in the first century church. And so we have an organic unity despite all of our different branches. But most appropriately, we understand the unity of the church not as a social thing, not sociologically, not as any kind of organizational aspect, but as a theological claim that the unity of the church is based in God and in God's promise to the church. Remember, we've talked about promise before and that our community is gathered around the promise of God. I'm going to talk about the word Catholic. Many struggle with this word because we know the Roman Catholic Church, and so we think when we talk about Catholic, it means one particular denomination. That is not the case. Roman Catholics are a particular denomination. There's also Eastern Rite Catholics. There are a number of other kinds of Catholic denominations. But the word Catholic means universal. It's spread throughout the inhabited, throughout the entire world. It means whole. It means not leaving anything out. It means it belongs to every sort of person. And it means it's universal in providing a remedy and cure for sin. So when we talk about a Catholic church, there's geographical emphasis, there's anthropological emphasis, there's even chronological emphasis. This is very important. The church is not bound by time. So the church exists today just as it existed in the 13th century and as it will exist well into the future. So when we gather on All Saints Day, which we just did here a bit ago, that means that we're gathered not just with the people in the room and not just all over the world on the same day to worship in that particular kind of way, but then on All Saints Day, we are commemorating the fact that all the saints gather as the church. That every time the word is rightly proclaimed and the sacraments are rightly administered, all of the saints are at the table of God, hearing God's word spoken to them and tasting God's word fed to them. We also have to talk about whether the church is holy or just human. This is one of the hardest parts of dealing with the church, I think, in the modern era because Rightly so, one of the big, perhaps biggest, accusations levied at the church is our hypocrisy, our unholiness, our very human willingness to wallow in sin, to be more focused on hate and judgment than on the love of God and the forgiveness offered by Jesus. 143 through about 147, we're going to walk you through some of what this means. But the focus, the quote that I want you to recall and remember, is that for Christian theology, we are clearly human in terms of an institution as a church. But the holiness of the church is a question that is not of its members, but of Christ. We are a church based on Jesus Christ. And because of that, Christ's holiness is what defines us. So it's not our holiness that we carry. So of course we would fail at times. Even more than that, there's a sense of the holiness of the church as being set apart or being dedicated to the work of God. You'll see this on 147. And so holiness is not just in terms of purity, but purpose. Holiness means just more than, oh, you're nice. Oh, you don't have faults. In fact, holiness means you have a goal in mind, that you have a purpose, a vision, a guide in your life. And that, too, comes from Jesus. It's not your vision. It is not the church's vision, but it is the head of the church, Jesus, who gives that vision, mission, and purpose to push into the future. That is the sense of holiness that belongs to the church. So, of course, the church fails and falters. But if we focus on Christ, the holiness of Christ in terms of both we trust God's purity as well as we trust God's purpose, then that is the holiness that belongs properly 
to the church through Jesus Christ. Now, you remember that I said Luther talked about the church as anywhere where the word of God is rightly proclaimed and the sacraments are rightly administered. This means that the word of God, who appears both in the sacraments, if you remember our conversation earlier about sacraments, and later we're going to talk even more specifically about sacraments in the next chapter, but even the word of God appears not just in the preaching, not just in the words, not just in the prayers, not just in the hymns, but in the very water and bread and wine, that the word of God is the thing that gathers the church. And so anytime the church gathers, the word of God is there. And the word of God is the thing that makes it valuable. Because the word of God is what reminds us that we were created with value. That these people, though broken, though sinful, they have the dignity of God's created images to carry to the world the wonder of the good news. That is the church constituted, gathered around the word of God. Later in the chapter, starting on 152, you're going to see the nature of the church according to the Second Vatican Council. This is a council that was gathered by the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church in the 20th century, to talk about the nature of a number of theological themes, but including the church. Well, this is pretty impressive because post-Reformation, there was not great relationships between most Christian denominations in terms of unity. There were a number of attempts at bringing unity, but it was often one denomination trying to exercise control or influence over another. But the Second Vatican Council invited a number of ecumenical partners to take part, not as voting members, but as observers and contributors to the conversation. And so they talk about the nature of Christ at the center of they talk about the nature of Christ as the gathering emphasis, that word that is active. They talk about the nature of the laity, about the people who are actively involved in the church but not employers, employed by the church. So not just the priests, not just the monks, not just the nuns, but everyone involved in the church. So the Second Vatican Council actually seems to echo some themes of the Reformation, emphasizing the value and vocation of all people in the church. You're going to read from a hymn by Isaac Watts. He wrote a number of wonderful hymns. You might know When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. But here you're going to read from another hymn that talks about the nature of the church as a garden. Let's get back to a bit of the biological imagery that we talked about before. But it's also drawing on how Augustine, St. Augustine, who we talked about before, focuses on the Song of Songs and how the nature of the church is, in fact, God's growth, God's tending of our soil, using us to be fertile land for the world. That's the nature of church from this Christian perspective. Thank you for this week. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll be glad to work with you through them. Y'all take care.